Okay, uh, let's go ahead and uh, get started. <clears throat> so, uh, good afternoon and welcome to our fireside chat on the state of the art for avoiding double counting and double issuance. My name is Joanne Hawkeiser and I'm a product manager at S&P Global. Uh, joining me today are two distinguished leaders in the carbon markets. We have Kristen Gorgonpour, who's the Vice President of Programs for the Climate Action Reserve, and she oversees the implementation of CARS registry services, including the California Offset Project Registry and Climate Forward. Also, we have Jeff Berman, who is the Senior Director for Registries at Expansive, where he's responsible for digital infrastructure, design, and implementation of registries for the environmental markets. Kristen and Jeff, thanks so much for connecting with me today. I look forward to a very uh, insightful discussion. So um, in terms of setting the stage and ensuring that we're all on the same page, Jeff, um, perhaps you could take a moment and define what double counting is and why is this conversation <laughs> coming up from time to time? Sure, no, and um, thanks to everyone who's in the audience, especially all of the non-coworkers who showed up for the last session of the last day. Um, so in the, in the world of double, double something, double everything, um, I, I see a few broad categories. Um, one is if two credits are issued for the same reduction within the same, within one registry. Uh, the second category would be two credits are issued for the same reduction on two different registries. And then there's a, th a third broad category that we also sort of need to talk about. And that's if the same credit is transacted to two different parties at the same time. So there is uh, a, a lack of clarity as to who actually owns the asset. Now, I think that we can group all of those as double counting, double issuance, double, double something. But to be clear, there's sort of three distinct challenges or, or potential problems. Um, and each of them has their own separate set of, of solutions, some of which are going to be technological solutions and a number of others that are going to be primarily operational. And really, why are we, why are we talking about this now? Um, I think Kristen would agree, we've always talked about double counting. Like, that, it, it, this has always been an issue um, in, in a space that relies on, just inherently relies on, complicated measurements that in, in a lot of ways, or in, in a lot of cases, um, rely on, on number first, establishing some sort of counterfactual and a baseline that you're, you're ultimately crediting uh, an activity against. You know, making sure that those baselines and those counterfactuals are appropriately set, this has always been uh, a critical element of, of the carbon crediting space. Um, but we are talking about it a heck of a lot more these days. And, and I think there's a, a couple of reasons for that. Number one, the markets are just growing and maturing so that people are just more aware of this as an issue uh, as, as the markets grow and mature. Uh, another one that, you know, Kristen should probably weigh on much more than I can, but just as measurement technology improves, um, monitoring technology, things like that, you know, it's, it's potentially able to flag additional areas of concern where we just weren't able to do that 10 or 15 years ago. Um, but the, the third sort of market-related reason actually probably has to do mostly with Article 6. And this potential world where every country is potentially going to have a, a registry system of their own for Article 6 participation and compliance. Uh, in some cases, that Article 6 national registry will be issuing credits. In other cases, it will just be documenting credits that are issued on an independent standards bodies registry. And the need for all of those systems to be interconnected to make sure that there is no instance of, of double counting, um, and particularly in that second category where one reduction is reflected on, on two separate registries. Thank you. We're going to come back to interconnected and interoperability. That is, seems to be some buzzwords we've heard over the last few days. Um, 
Let's talk about uh, from a buyer perspective, uh, what are the risks and potential implications associated with uh, double counting, double issuance? I mean, it, 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 it all comes down to like our favorite, it's not a buzzword, but you know, like our favorite word uh, these days, which is just market integrity. Um, and you know, how the, the specific integrity concerns I think are going to be different when you're thinking about a standards body versus a project or a project developer. Um, but at least from, from the buyer's perspective, you know, it, on some level it comes down to just being seen as participating in a mechanism where the associated climate change mitigation potential is, is, is perceived to be low. Um, and kind of, I guess, the, the market implication of that would be something like you, you just own something in which the value could potentially decline or any sort of reputational risk associated with, with having purchased it in the first place. Um, to kind of like take a step back though, the, the, the implication from a, a wider market or, or sector perspective is to be honest, I think that it will lead to or can potentially lead to just less innovation in the sector. That at the end of the day, a carbon credit is a financing tool. You know, you, you do one activity and it costs something and it's emissions intense. You do another activity and it costs more but it is less emissions intense and the carbon credit is what makes that project whole. And what we need to see and what we want to see, to be honest, is additional innovation. Um, you want to use uh, the crediting mechanisms as that financing tool and you want to be able to push the boundaries, I think. Uh, Kristen, uh, from the project developer standpoint or from program standards, uh, risks and implications? Yeah, I, sorry. Can you guys hear me okay? I'll, I'll not slouch. Um, yeah, I think from a program's perspective, I, you know, Jeff brought up mark, market integrity and I think that's really important. I think that's really where the registries and the standards are are coming from, right? I think, you know, when we talk about, um, and we'll get into this in a bit, but like protocol stacking and kind of the quantification issues associated with like double double counting, um, we really like ask, ask ourselves like, what is happening atmospherically? We're always worried about the environmental integrity about what is happening when we're issuing these credits. And so from the reserves perspective, and I think um, most of the, you know, major registries, we're really, like, thinking about how do we keep the system whole um, and who's responsible for that. And I think from, you know, the reserves perspective for any credit that we're issuing on our registry, we want to make sure that those credits have not been accounted for um, anywhere else. Um, particularly when those credits have been used towards some, you know, mitigation or some, you know, climate target. Um, we really have to think about, like, we want to make sure that the reduction actually happened and that it is compensating for something. So I think from the reserve and the standards perspective, um, we really have to think about the risk associated with that double counting and what that means for us as a program to potentially replace any credits that are, are double issued because at the end of the day, you know, it's like double counting, double, you know, issuance, double use. Um, at the end of the day for us, it's, it's a, it potentially is an over-issued credit and we have to make that, that compensation and, and the reserve does that a couple of different ways. Um, but mainly, you know, we, we think about the project developer and kind of compensating for the, having them compensate for that over issuance but you know at the end of the day it's it's our role to really make sure that 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 system is whole um, I think from a project developer standpoint um, it really gets into the weeds about how they're kind of implementing their projects um, making sure that any like ownership that they have is very clear um, and that they're kind of like working with any stakeholders that may be involved, particularly if it's like a nature-based project, um, that they're aware that there's like a carbon project happening there. Um, because when we have issues of, you know, double counting um, and where these issues are identified, it really um, creates reputational risks um, and 
and that's something that the project developer needs to kind of keep in mind. Uh, Kristen, uh, could you share with us uh, maybe what processes uh, the reserve has in place to detect um, double counting, double issuance, and we'll uh, save uh, the technology part a little bit later. Yeah, um, so I can talk about that, and I think I saw our reserve administrator come into the to the room, but I think, you know, there's some sort of um, at the, like, programmatic um, part of the process. So anytime we get a project submitted to the reserve, um, you know, we do our due diligence to look to see, um, you know, well, one, what's the project? Is it additional? But, like, has this project been listed anywhere else? Has it been issued credits anywhere else? Um, and if so, we do actually allow for, like, uh, transfer projects from other registries. Uh, we don't we do not issue um, credits for any reporting period that has already been issued credits. Um, so on that side, we have a mechanism in place with like a project transfer form where a project developer actually has to like attest that they are not going to seek any more credits on the other registry, um, that it's solely being listed on our registry. And so we kind of do that review to make sure, you know, what is happening. And then when we get to the project registration side, um, we're also doing that check. We're kind of looking, and it, it's, it can be tedious, right? Um, and we'll talk about the technology, I guess that's coming um, later, but you know, we're going to the other registries to look like, is there a, pro is there a project, the same project here? Um, you know, we do have like the location information. Um, and so we're able to kind of do that check, and we do that every time we're going to issue a credit. We need to do that initial due diligence. Um, I will also say, I think we also think about it from like the protocol development um, perspective as well. Um, and so there's a couple of things. So um, just screening new protocols, we kind of look at should we be doing this protocol? Are there other maybe environmental markets that are, could potentially be crediting the same activity? Um, do we want to you know, do a protocol in that area? Um, and so we do look at things like that. I think um, in terms of just you know, once we've decided to move forward with a particular methodology, um, we do do an assessment of like any payment or credit stacking to make sure that there's, you know, what other incentive programs are out there, um, how should they be considered in the context of the carbon project um, to make sure that we're not having these double claiming um, issues. Um, and then in cases um, where somebody may be enrolled in another program that might be similar, um, or where they may have received some kind of payments uh, related to the project activity that we're crediting for. Um, programmatically, we also require that they disclose, the project developer um, discloses that, um, you know, they're participating in these programs or they have participated in these programs so that we can make a determination whether, like, we should also be crediting for that same, um, same activity. Um, and then lastly, I guess, with regards to the protocol um, development process, we also really, in our protocols, we use a standardized approach. We define who, like, the project owner is, who can actually claim those greenhouse gas reductions or removals. Um, and it's really clear and specific um, who's able to, you know, bring the project forward. Um, we do have mechanisms where that right can be transferred. Um, but that's verified as well. So, you know, it's going through a verification process to make sure that, like, one, we're issuing credits to the, you know, the correct, correct entity um, and that they're potentially not being issued somewhere else or there's not somebody else maybe as they're going on site that's like, wait a minute. I didn't know about the, this carbon project. I'm already enrolled over here. So those are some of, the, like, the broader, I think, bigger picture things that we do. That's great. Uh, Jeff, um, when conducting due diligence for carbon project investment, uh, what factors do you think corporates look for to help minimize the risk? Yeah, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm, every every buyer is going to be different, um, mm -hmm. but 
I think in general, there, there really is a trend towards just buyers being much savvier um, than they used to be. And you know, they know, even, even for, for uh, any credits that are being purchased for some sort of mandatory compliance obligation, like a California eligible, AB32 eligible offset, um, you know, people really want to know a lot more about the projects and the credits than, than they did you know, even a couple of years ago. Um, but my, I mean, I, I think my big picture concern for this market is that we're actually creating a system that is, is, to be honest, just too complicated for buyers to use in practice. You know, even as they become savvier, it's, it's honestly, it's just asking too much for them to be the experts in the science that goes into a methodology. It's asking way too much for them to manually check or even automatically check credit issuances across multiple standards bodies. It's, it's asking just too much for them to do background checks on every single one of their counterparties and make sure that every credit that they thought they purchased ultimately ended up in, in their accounts. And, and this is why you know, I, I really do believe that whatever, the more that we can do upstream of the final buyer uh, as a, a standards body, as a registry operator, uh, as a marketplace is, is honestly the better. Because if, if the VCM, if carbon credits are going to be a critical tool towards just redirecting capital to fight climate change, you, you need the buyers. Um, and the, the systems that you can put into place that make buyers feel comfortable is at, at every point in the life cycle is I just think going to be very critical. Um, okay. Um, let's shift gears and talk about the technology solutions. Uh, we know that there are various uh, technology solutions underway, and I'm going to take a moment and do a selfish uh, plug to the S&P Meta Registry, which helps to bring data integrity to the markets, as well as to detect scenarios of double counting and double claiming. Um, but Jeff, uh, what other technologies are out there that um, are looking to address uh, this issue? And if you're able to touch upon the interconnected element and interoperability and whether or not that might help uh, to uh, address uh, sure. double counting, double issuance. Yeah, and, and to, to, to sort of set the stage a little bit, you know, when we think, and, and we had a, a workshop on this uh, a couple of days ago, that digital infrastructure is just kind of fundamental to uh, environmental commodities just at every point in the life cycle. You know, you have a, a registry which is, you know, that it acts as the single source of truth for every, uh, every transaction, every activity that occurs for a standard. Uh, you may have something like a meta registry or a portfolio management tool that allows a user to uh, manage their holdings across you know, a, a full suite of different registries and different standards. Uh, and then a, a marketplace where you know, buyers, buyers can find sellers uh, or sellers can find buyers. And there are, the, the, the remarkable thing is, is that the technological solutions that you need to, um, to address double counting double issuance at every point in that life cycle exist and are deployed today, <laughs> you know? And um, it's really just kind of a matter of sort of scaling them out. And, and just to sort of mention a few, you know, at the registry level, talking about sort of, you know, project boundaries, um, you know, our next gen registry comes with a, a full suite of geolocational technologies where you can map out uh, or it automatically maps out you know, the boundaries of a project so you can compare to make sure there, there are not overlapping boundaries between two projects. Um, at the registry level, every credit that is issued uh, comes with a unique and fully immutable serial number uh, so that you can track that credit from one transaction to another. Um, there are transaction logs. Uh, every, every activity in a registry system goes into uh, a transaction log. And, and I'm not talking just like kind of issuances, but every project on board, uh, every credit transaction, every credit generation, transaction from one account holder to another, every retirement, um, even things in, you know, kind of thinking about kind of like bad actors and uh, transactions, 
you know, every, every login attempt, every failed login attempt, if you, you know, fat finger a password. This is all stuff that is being done today. And one thought that we've actually had at Expansive and we're playing with it with, with, some, uh, with some standards bodies is actually just making a version of that transaction log uh, publicly available, just like some other public reports, such that to give everyone confidence that everything is sort of being done. Um, I mentioned portfolio management tools, which is also sort of critical because it allows you to compare uh, issuances and holdings across multiple standards. Um, and then kind of the, the last one, because it's, it's sort of coming up again and again, um, when thinking about transactions and specifically marketplace transactions, um, a, a credit encumbrance feature, where when a credit is posted onto the, the CBL exchange for sale, um, that credit is, is frozen in an account, and um, it is only released to whoever the buyer is once cash has been transacted. So cash goes into, into the seller's account, um, and the credit goes into the buyer's account automatically. Um, this is another thing that is sort of necessary to think about double transactions and, and, again, double everything, but it's also a solution that is being deployed right now. Lot, lots of stuff underway. Um, I'm very intrigued by the uh, publishing of the audit logs, um, all about transparency, but perhaps there might be some concerns around data privacy or, you know. That's, that's sort of the balance, right? And yeah. it's, it's figuring out where is that sort of balance between, you know, opening up the kimono entirely and uh, <laughs> making sure that, you know, these are financial markets that require privacy and, and just to, just to be clear, everything that Expansive does, um, uh, all of our platforms are, are SOC 2 certified, so we, 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 uh, we uphold the highest data security standards and, and data privacy standards. But there's ways to sort of do this via you know, public reports where we work with the standards bodies to open up that information a little bit to, to again, provide buyers with the confidence that everything is being done uh, safely and securely uh, and privately, but while at the same time making sure that you know we are doing everything to, to uh, from a technological perspective, to, to limit double issuance and double counting. That's great. <clears throat> um, let's uh, put a spotlight on projects. Uh, Kristen, over to you. Um, if two projects do not have overlapping boundaries but are in close proximity to each other, should that be considered double counting? <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I think um, I guess the simple answer is no. It's not uh, de depends. Maybe I shouldn't just be say no. Um, yeah. So as the uh, you know market is growing and becoming more complex, I think you know project developers are really like looking at their um, projects or maybe their land and thinking about like, well, how can I maximize the, the climate benefits um, here? And so what has come up more and more for us more recently is where we have situations where people want to report under different methodologies, uh, maybe on the same piece of land. Um, and, and we refer to that as like pro protocol stacking, methodology stacking, um, and, and it's something that can be done. Um, it occurs under lots of programs, but I think um, one thing that just needs to be kept in mind as we're talking about, um, you know, multiple methodologies, maybe in the same geographic area, really what we're concerned about is like that greenhouse gas boundary and like what is, like what activities are actually being credited. Because in that, in those cases, we don't want to credit one the same activity, but two, like, um, have the same boundaries where there's there's confusion about what what's happening. Um, I think from the reserves perspective, we do think about this a lot. We haven't had any projects to date where we where we have any kind of like protocol um, stacking. Um, but you know we do want people to maximize the climate benefits, like where it where it makes sense. And so, um, what we put in our protocols now is we essentially just say, hey, like if you want to report under a different methodology or multiple methodologies, you need to bring that to the reserve, and we'll make a determination whether we think it's appropriate. 
um, and, and determining the appropriateness of that really gets at um, the quantification um, and thinking about, well, what does the boundary look like um, where um, there could be you know, similar um, boundaries? Is there any reconciliation that can be done with that accounting? Um, but I think also sometimes it's not like that cut and dry, I think, programmatically as well. It's like, does this raise questions? Does it cause confusion about like what is happening? Um, is, you know, some of the questions that come up is like, well, I want to report under, you know, this methodology under the reserve and this one under VERA. Um, and we can't necessarily do like that reconciliation with the quantification because like we know our protocols, um, you know, we're not expert in other people's protocols. And so we've kind of limited that to date um, because we don't want to create any kind of uncertainty or questions about what might be happening with a particular project. Um, but I think back to just like your original question of, um, you know, hey, we're at the same, you know, location, is that double counting? No, probably not, maybe, it depends. Um, but it is one of the ways I think that you can start thinking about or like opening up that, doing that due diligence, right? Like, hey, there's, you know, there's this project on Vera's registry and the reserves registry, they're on this, you know, at the same location, what does that mean? How do I kind of like dig into that and get a sense of like what is actually happening? Um, we have been talking about kind of the technology um, that's in place currently um, to kind of uh, like the, to get at this double counting issue. Um, and so one of those things is like the CAD trust. Um, and so with the CAD trust, um, we are, um, Jeff and I are both on the technical committee for that. Um, but we're starting to have these conversations about and starting like a task force related to double, double counting is like from the registry's perspective, from the meta registry is like how do we start flagging these issues of potential double counting? And so location may be one of those areas to kind of start kind of digging into that. What about distance, the distance between projects and should there be parameters? <laughs> yeah, no, there there shouldn't be, right? It, it, at the end of the day, it's kind of, you know, a math problem and a quantification issue and looking at the activities that are, are being um, credited. But again, I think with just like location, um, I think it, it's, it's a really good starting place to figure out like what like what is happening here um, and kind of, especially when you have, you know, aggregated data, um, kind of like looking at where these, like these projects are. Um, so I think it, it is a good kind of mechanism as a starting place, but it might not necessarily be double counting. Okay, uh, let's, let's uh, shift over to governance. Um, Jeff, the measures that some of the governance bodies are taking uh, currently to ensure accountability in the market had tying that back into the double counting, double issuance. Do you want to speak speak to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think a great place for the governance bodies to begin acting is is just on encouraging system interoperability. You know, we, we kind of said that word throughout the last couple of days, mm -hmm. but you know, as this as the sector grows, mm -hmm. as the sector gets more complex, all the pro, uh, you know all the potential or, or the, all the potential and, and perceived problems can can more easily be addressed if we're all kind of like working and talking together, and that's what we sort of mean when we say interoperability. You know, and it means finding agreement on you know some unsexy things like KYC processes or data universal data security requirements. Um, working to collaborate on data sharing uh, across different systems. Because I think when we think about a, uh, a sector that is just growing more complex by the day, you need to be able to, to work together. And mm -hmm. ensuring that the systems are interoperable will make all of the other, all of the other work just considerably easier. Okay. Yeah. 
And I'll add, I think, you know, I think governance is a good question, right? So we've been talking about like technology and, you know, we have these mechanisms, right, to flag double counting or, um, yeah, essentially to flag it. But it's like, who's responsible then for like reconciling that across, um, you know, program, <laughs> programs, right? We're, we all operate um, independently. And so I think there's conversations, I think, even within the CAD trust, right? Like, okay, well, we've, you know, we flag this, what do, what do we do with it? Um, and who's responsible for that? Um, you know, you have to do something with the data, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's gonna be a big, a big question, right? Is like, how do we kind of like work together um, to, you know, figure out if it's, if it is double counting. And I think we're gonna have to have these conversations across, you know, registries. And then I, I think too, like, okay, well, what if there's a dispute or there's disagreement across registries? Um, what do we do there? Who plays the role in kind of, you know, making a decision on what, what has happened? I, I agree, because I, I don't see this turning into a world where you're merging standards um, so that there's kind of like one single, one single standard. Um, I don't think anyone particularly wants that. I think you lose a lot when it comes to, um, to be honest, when it comes to innovating, when it comes to ensuring that there are technical specialists for certain registries or regional specialists for, for or technical specialists for, for standards bodies, I should say, uh, or regional specialists for standards bodies. But I do think it will eventually in, involve putting the systems in place so that um, if there is a dispute, there, there are agreed upon courses of action across all of the major players. Mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, pick up on <clears throat> what you just mentioned, uh, Kristen, about working together. Uh, some of you may have sat in on the session yesterday on registry collaboration where the uh, big four <laughs> um, got together and talked a little bit about collaborating. And I wonder if you're able uh, to give any insight um, into um, what that might entail. Um, you know, I'm sure best practices, pain points, challenges, dealing with double counting, double issuance, does that come up on the agenda? Yeah, that's a good uh, mm -hmm. question. And I think this was talked about in that panel, but I think, you know, to date, we've always kind of worked across registries um, and had kind of informal, like, collaboration. Um, so wherever, you know, we've identified an issue um, or had questions, you know, I've never hesitated to reach out to another registry, right? Because I think, you know, all of us, again, are concerned with environmental integrity, and so um, we're not trying to, you know, withhold information. And um, so I think um, that's always been something, um, I think, programmatically, we felt like we could do, you know, reach out to ACR, Vera, whatever it may be. Um, but I do, I think, in terms of the ICP um, collaboration, um, not um, a big focus on, like, you know, how are we going to try to reconcile this um, double counting? Because again, I think in, I think Jeff talked about this earlier, like this is like always been, uh, you know, around. It's yeah. not like a, a new, <laughs> new thing. Um, and so, and again, we have these kind of mechanisms in place. I think the question is, as the technology improves um, and, you know, and we have more registries kind of tapping into the, these meta registries and we're flagging, you know, potential issues. I think the question um, or what is going to need to be resolved as part of the collaboration is how we really um, make decisions and kind of clear these questions of double issuance, particularly like if they're made public, right? Because if you're a project developer or a buyer of a credit or holder of a credit and it's been flagged publicly as like potentially being double issued, um, probably creates a lot, a lot of issues for you. So you want that information kind of reconciled as fast as you can. Um, and so I think from a programmatic perspective, a pro, you know, a standards perspective, you know, I think we're thinking about that is like, how do you, like what processes can we put in place um, to really kind of 
um, make decisions quickly about like what's happening and then I think just um, how do we communicate that information and, and what does that process look like because you know we don't want any questions lingering for a project that's like where it clearly isn't a double counted issue so I think there's like really kind of like nitty gritty probably not that interesting <laughs> things that need to be done of like, you know, what does the process look like from end to end to kind of like resolve all of these these issues? I think, yeah, I mean, um, look, any, any, a technological solution is only mm -hmm. as good as what you do with it, right? And, um, you know, we can put as many sort of technical solutions in place, but, you know, it's going to come down to making sure procedures, onboarding, KYC procedures, checks, are all being implemented, and I think, you know, to be honest, you know, being communicated to the, you know, to, to market participants, to account holders, so that they know what, you know, what the course of action will be in any, in any circumstance. Yeah. Let's uh, focus on consumer confidence, um, Jeff. Do you think there are ways that consumer confidence uh, can be improved upon, considering concerns around double? Counting double issuance. Um, yes, um, you know I, I think you know ag again. Whatever systems, whatever solutions need to be put into place to make buyers feel comfortable is critical, and <clears throat> kind of like thinking thinking it through. You know, one thing that we've kind of heard over and over again in, in the last in the last year, especially is, you know, I'm a buyer, I'm a financial player, financial intermediary, and, you know, if my, if my holdings are low, <laughs> if my book of business is kind of small, no one internally kind of cares what I do, you know, and, and but the challenge is, though, is that, you know, if you want, that's fine for, you know, a, a million dollar book of business, but for a 50 million dollar book of business, you need to have certain systems in place, and it's, it's, making sure buyers feel comfortable with the, the slew of information, but it's also making everyone else at a, at a financial institution or a corporation feel comfortable. You know, it's, it's making sure the IT guys feel comfortable. It's making sure the risk guys feel comfortable. It's making sure the compliance guys feel comfortable. And it's doing all of that stuff that is, to be honest, a, a little detached from the actual issuance or holding of a carbon credit um, that, to be honest, is, I, I think, just fundamental to, to growing markets. Sure. <clears throat> okay, uh, perception. Um, Jeff or Kristen, um, the occurrence of double counting and double issuance, do we think it's more often a coincidence or is it, I'm going to say the dirty word, carbon fraud? I know. Go first? <laughs> I feel like Jeff has like way more to say about <laughs> this no, no, no. than no, no. me on this topic. So maybe um, I'll start. We thought maybe this question would be <laughs> provocative. I don't. I don't know. Um, I, I think from my perspective, I you know I don't. Yes, of course. There's always bad actors in the market. I mean, we saw that early on. Um, but I think generally in terms of like the work that we do at the reserve, um, I don't think we're actively seeing people trying to like register their project in you know, multiple registries or under different programs. Yes. I think they're thinking about how we like, ma how they maximize like the climate benefits. But I think like we, you know, we definitely have those like open, uh, conversations with those folks. Um, and, you know, we have some processes in place to really make sure that we are trying to work with, like, the best um, actors. You know, we, we do KYC on anyone that's, like, working under our program. Um, but often I think what happens is where there may be credits that are double issued because it, it's – mostly related to people accidentally enrolling in some other program and they disclose that to us and say, you know, hey, we did X, Y, and Z, and then we're able to kind of, um, you know, make that correction for the, you know, over issuance or the double issuance. Um, and so I think one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, all these projects too are going through like a verification, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and so, um, 
verifiers are really looking at the ownership and talking to people like on site to really understand kind of like what's going on. Um, and so I, I honestly think where we have cases of, um, you know, double issuance or double claiming, I don't know that it's necessarily like intentional. Um, I think it's really um, sometimes stakeholders are unaware, particularly when you have a project set up where you have like a project developer, you know, doing all the work and there's like this landowner that might be kind of a little bit more removed from the project um, and they don't, you know, have knowledge you know, all this in-depth knowledge about like carbon markets and what they're allowed to do. Um, so I think like where we've seen potential issues of double issuance, I think that's from a program perspective, like where we're seeing and it. it's it not it's not necessarily in intentional. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think oh. we're going to uh, pause oh. with our questions up here and take questions from the audience. Any questions for us? Hi. Um, so as a project proponent or a developer, what are some available tools for us to be checking this not at the registry? Because by the point at which we've gotten to registering a project, we've already done all the project activities and perhaps should not have been doing so. Um, like how do we manage that risk on the front end is my question. What are the tools available or, yeah. Yeah, sorry. So. Um, <coughs> You know, I think, so it sounds like maybe potentially for like your project, like you might be working with other people that might have like the ownership of the greenhouse gas reduction removal. I think, you know, for us as a program, we have like, again, as I mentioned earlier, very like standardized um, protocols where it really um, defines who is able to kind of claim, you know, those, those credits. Um, and that's, um, I think, as a project developer, you need to kind of do that do, where you're working with, you know, other stakeholders that, you know, control that, right? I think you need to do that due diligence. Um, I wouldn't say we have necessarily have any, like, tools by which, like, you can, like, tease that out. I think it's really part of that, like, you know, protocol, or excuse me, project development process to understand kind of what what is happening, right? Um, I think one of the highest risk project areas are typically these like nature-based projects. Um, that's where there's a lot more incentive programs, crediting programs, um, other like environmental commodities that might be involved in. So I think really understanding kind of like the scope of that within your project type and really having those conversations with um, you know, those project proponents about, like, have you done this this program and really getting at those things. But I would say, like, programmatically, the reserve at least doesn't have tools where you can kind of, like, you know, check, get, you know, a checkbox list. It's really, I think it's a really holistic look at it. Um, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Um. The, you know, the, the, the standard itself remains kind of, or the, the methodology, I should say, is what everything is sort of judged against, right? Um, and <clears throat> I hate to say it, but I mean, I, I think kind of like going back to the methodology and working with the standards body to clarify any sort of points of, you know, points of uh, where where there's a lack of clarity or a point of contention is, I think, going to be critical. And one reason I'm just sort of thinking about this is because, you know, this is, this is a sector of innovation. You know, it's a sector of kind of continuous improvement. Um, it's a sector where, to be honest, you know, the, the, the problems or the issues of 2024 were, are not the same that, that existed 10 years ago. Um, it's a, a sector where I think there is a, a real, uh, a real desire to constantly improve methodologies, I guess specifically, but procedures more generally. Um, so I mean, I think kind of yeah, making sure and, and going through and understanding 
what the requirements are for a particular methodology is, is just absolutely critical for, for a project, especially now. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great point. I mean, I, you know, going to the registry to be like, hey, you know, this, how should we be quantifying this? Or, oh, we know about um, this particular um, reporting that has been happening on this property. Um, can we still report to you as a registry, right? Like we require that information to be disclosed to us so that we can potentially do any reconciliation on the quantification side to ensure that we don't have any yeah. double counting. It's like you know, the, the, the question of like, well, you know, is a, if two projects are really close to each other or if there's two different greenhouse gases, is it double counting? I, I, it seems like the answer is sort of like, it, it depends. Yeah. I don't, you know, it, it depends. Uh, sometimes it might be. Sometimes it might not be, um, but I think kind of the way to determine that is by sort of asking the questions and, and figuring it out. Yeah. Any other questions? Hello, I'm Ram. Uh, so my question specific to agriculture sector. So if a field boundary, uh, farmer is working with one project developer developer for this year, so after generating credits for this year, if he's deciding to start working with other project developer for next year, so is it double counting or how to handle that kind of scenario? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I think, um, so in terms of like, it sounds like maybe for like an agricultural based project um, yeah so this might get into the to the weeds a little bit um, so you might have some like fields rolled enrolled into your like your project um, typically I would say like no you wouldn't be able to like take them out um, because there's like ongoing like MRV requirements associated with the permanence of the credits that have been um, given to that field under that particular project um, and that particular project developer is like really responsible for that but then when you get into to the quantification um, side and I'm behind you is our um, associate director who handles all of our um, agricultural protocols so hopefully I get this part right um, but you know when under our protocol we look at kind of like project start dates and what would the you know what has been happening on that field um, and it may become part of like baseline activity so like you may not have any crediting there at that point uh, but right now we don't under our program um, allow kind of fields to you know drop in and, and cross over it's um, one there's just ri like risk associated um, with that right it causes like a lot of like confusion um, but I think particularly too with like the ongoing like MRV requirements and really like monitoring that over like, you know, a hundred year time frame, um, it, it, it should kind of really stay. I mean, fields can drop out, um, but they can't ever come back in under our program. Okay, I think uh, we're coming toward the end of our session. Um, just a quick recap, uh, we heard about a variety of measures to address um, avoiding double counting, double issuance. We heard about technology solutions, uh, programmatic measures, operational processes, governance, and uh, collaboration across the uh, standards and the programs, and uh, all of these working together to help um, stimulate confidence uh, in the marketplace and subsequently to grow the markets. So uh, Kristen and Jeff, thank you very much for an insightful discussion. And to the audience, thank you very much for staying uh, toward the tail end of the conference. Uh, for those of you who are traveling, safe travels. And for all of you women in carbon markets, uh, happy Women's History Month. <laughs> thank you very much.